Stanley Kubrick produced many masterpieces, but none as striking and as gut-wrenching as A Clockwork Orange. The now immortal 1971 dystopian crime film adapted from Anthony Burgess's novel of the same name, it uses disturbing imagery to make big statements about social, political and economic issues. Set in this dystopian near-future Britain, there is psychiatry, gang culture, juvenile delinquency and a healthy chunk of Beethoven in there as well. To this day, there is still no other film like it, and its standing in pop culture infamy will likely never change. Despite this level of notoriety, though, a lot of the film's production stories seem to have gone untold in the years since its release. Everything from problems with the initial production to a change in its central star to, well, a few unsavoury moments that actually happened on set. So with that in mind, please now firmly attach the lid locks to your eyes, because my name is Adam Cleary, and these are 20 things you didn't know about A Clockwork Orange. Number 20, it was originally called the Ludovico Technique. Despite the book being called A Clockwork Orange, Kubrick initially had the screenplay titled The Ludovico Technique, after the seminal scene where Alex is subjected to aversion therapy. In the end, though, he changed his mind, and with so many other elements of the screenplay exactly mirroring the book, it was decided that the title should as well. Which is just as well, really. Number 19, Ping Pong helped keep the budget low. After filming, Malcolm McDowell and Stanley Kubrick began the unenviable task of the movie's post-production recording sessions, which took two full weeks of work. To break up the monotony of the job, the pair would take regular breaks to play ping pong. However, McDowell was only contracted to be paid for a single week's work during these sessions and, upon finding out, challenged Kubrick on why he'd been working for twice that. Kubrick simply responded that the other week in question was the time they'd spent playing ping pong and he didn't expect to be getting paid for that, did he? Number 18, Kubrick had the film pulled from cinemas after death threats. Following the release of the movie, a spate of copycat break-ins spread across the UK, and the film was predictably blamed. The media pushed for it to be banned outright, but Kubrick stood firm and refused to let the distributors cave to the pressure. Enough was enough, though, when the director began receiving death threats from those who opposed the film, threatening to break into his home and murder his family in a manner akin to the movie itself. Kubrick immediately had the film pulled from cinemas and asked the studio not to release it again until after his death. Number 17, actors would occasionally refer to the book rather than the screenplay. Despite not originally liking the book very much, and more on that later, Stanley Kubrick eventually came to appreciate it so much that the original screenplay was largely just the book's transcript with additional stage direction. Even the final version of the screenplay was allegedly so close to what was in the book that the majority of the cast and crew would actually just carry around copies of the latter rather than the former. When in doubt, just consulting the source material for guidance rather than the adaptation. Number 16, the original cut was almost four hours long. Clocking in at nearly two and a half hours long as it is, nobody's ever going to accuse a clockwork orange of being short. But the original cut of the movie was nearly twice that at allegedly over four hours long. Unsure how to strip away the chaff from what he was quickly realizing was a masterpiece, Kubrick was forced to hire several assistant directors to help with the editing. In the end, they were able to remove over 90 minutes of footage, nearly a movie in itself, but the film still clocked in at 137 minutes long. Number 15, Kubrick demanded all unused footage was then erased. Now, if you're listening to that previous fact and wondering why we haven't since been inundated with special releases and director's cuts a la Star Wars and Blade Runner, it's because such a feat was rendered impossible by Kubrick himself. After the final version was sent away to distributors, he examined everything he had left over and demanded that all the unused footage be destroyed. Quite why he insisted on this still isn't known, but it ensured that the first release remains the definitive one. And I'm sure his estate are absolutely thrilled about that. Number 14, Kubrick needed to prove he could work without money. Many of the ideas and production techniques used in the film were, for a director of Kubrick standing, incredibly low budget. Lighting was all done naturally, very few sets were built, and the crew was kept to an absolute minimum. This surprised many at the time, but Kubrick was out to prove a point that, following the headline-grabbing sums of money thrown around for 2001 A Space Odyssey, he could work just as easily without big financial backing. Number 13, all but three sets were real locations. As mentioned, the desire to keep the budgets down meant that, where possible, filming was done in real locations a short drive from Kubrick's house. Alex's apartment block, for example, was Thames Mead housing estate in South East London, which I'm pretty sure is still there to this day. However, three scenes did require sets to be built. The Corovo milk bar, the check-in area of the prison, and the bathroom where Alex takes a bath were all built at a factory in Hertfordshire. Ironically, this location was actually the closest to where Kubrick lived and was thus his favourite. 
Number 12, the name was just something overheard in a pub. There have admittedly been a few different explanations offered by writer Anthony Burgess as to quite exactly where the inspiration for the book and the movie's title came from, but the most frequently quoted also happens to be the best. Sitting in a London pub in 1945, he overheard someone talking and used the phrase, as queer as a clockwork orange. He really liked it and just assumed it must be some sort of rhyming slang he was unfamiliar with and later attached it to one of his projects. Number 11, there was a gruesome on-set injury. Now, arguably the most iconic scene in the entire movie sees Alex strapped to a chair as part of his aversion therapy, with his eyes physically held open so as to stop him looking away from what he's seeing. What follows here is not for the squeamish. The device used to hold his eyes open is specially designed for people who are lying down. But to get the right shot, it was agreed by everybody on set that McDonald would need to sit up in the chair. This led to him slicing the cornea of his eye on the lid lock. He was fine, of course, and back shooting the film within a number of days, but still, oh jeez. Number 10, there is a subtle 2001 A Space Odyssey reference. One of the more famous locations used in the movie was the Chelsea Drugstore, which provided the backdrop to the record shop scene. A bar at the time, it was one of the trendier London night spots of the day and was allegedly frequented by the Rolling Stones. However, the more keen-eyed amongst you will notice that front and centre of the shop's counter is none other than the soundtrack to 2001 A Space Odyssey. At the time, it was Kubrick's most recent and most famous outing, but not exactly a movie that was renowned for its soundtrack. Number 9, Malcolm McDowell was the one and only choice for Alex. Now, alright, yes, directors always like to look lovingly back on a great performance and insist there was nobody else they ever wanted to play the role. 99% of the time it's an entirely empty platitude and, in most cases, just a flat-out lie. However, it is true for Kubrick and A Clockwork Orange. Mick Jagger and most of the Stones were already attached to the film, but when the director was brought on board, he insisted on replacing him with McDowell, whose debut performance in If had caught his eye. Number 8, the book had two endings and the film uses the grim one. In the UK version of the book, distributors were worried that the ending didn't give enough closure to the reader, and also that it sort of glorified all the misdeeds. So as a solution, Anthony Burgess changed the ending so that Alex expressed regret over his actions and, in a roundabout way, sought contrition. American audiences had no such problem with the finale though and quite enjoyed the underlying message that sex and violence are, by and large, pretty good. Given the choice between the two endings, Kubrick opted for the latter. Which is just as well, really, as having an ending where your protagonist repents against all the things he's done in the film is… bad. Number 7, Darth Vader has a cameo. I mean, he sort of does. The strapping aid of the disabled writer is played by none other than David Prowse, the man who did all the physical performances of Darth Vader in the Star Wars saga before James Earl Jones legendarily added the voice work. Initially, Prowse had raised an issue with the scene where he's forced to carry the writer around, stating it would be too strenuous because your name is not one take, Kubrick, is it, you see? Despite everyone within earshot assuming he would immediately be sacked on the spot for showing such disrespect to the director, Kubrick actually found it quite funny and just laughed it off. Number 6, the Ludovico Doctor is a real doctor. One of the slightly less grisly facts about the aversion therapy scene is that one of the actors playing a doctor was, in fact, a real doctor. The man charged with administering the eye drops was a trained MD from Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. He wasn't originally scripted to be in the scene, but Stanley Kubrick eventually opted to use him because of how important the actual drops became to filming. McDowell simply could not keep his eyes open without them, so the man providing them was included in the film. Number 5, Kubrick. Kubrick originally hated the book. Yep. Despite how dearly he would come to love it, Kubrick really didn't like Anthony Burgess's novel the first time he read it. The Nadsat language that the author created comprised of Russian and Cockney rhyming slang was apparently too confusing for him and he turned down suggestions to adapt it into a film. It was only years later when his attempts to get a Napoleon biopic greenlit fell through did he reconsider the idea after the protagonist of Alex had stuck with him as a Richard III type character. Number 4, the Droog's costume was discovered by accident. The iconic look of Alex, so often referenced in pop culture and to this day Halloween costumes, was not something lifted directly from the book. Rather, it was just a happy accident that occurred during the initial wardrobing sessions of the film. Coming directly from a local cricket match, Malcolm McDowell just happened to have his uniform on him and, after hours of failing to find the right look, incorporated it into his costuming process. It was, however, Kubrick who took a long, hard look at it and suggested he actually wear his cup on the outside of his clothes. 
Number three, it took them 28 minutes to film the fast motion sex scene. There's a rather unique sex scene in A Clockwork Orange where Alex and two women from the record shop decide to just start going at it. However, you barely see anything gratuitous as Kubrick made the decision to speed up the footage to try and get around the inevitable X rating. It uh, didn't work, sadly, as censors feared that adult film companies would see this trick, getting around a rating, then attempt to use it themselves, so they just gave a clockwork orange one anyway. But the scant few seconds we do get to see actually comprises of 28 minutes of uninterrupted footage. I mean, it's a tough job, this acting lark, but someone's got to do it. Number two, the entire singing in the rain moment was improvised. During rehearsals for the movie, Stanley Kubrick was concerned that the now famously brutal scene where the gang attacks the writer and his wife wasn't quite clicking. He felt that it lacked delirium or that it lacked an edge, so he asked McDowell to do something outrageous. His response was to dance around and belt out singing in the rain. When asked why, he offered the following answer because that song is Hollywood's gift to the world of euphoria, and that's what the character is feeling at the time. Number one, and it cost them £10,000. Believing that the end result of this scene was too good not to use, Kubrick then set about petitioning the studio to shell out the money required to license the song to use in the film. Given the context of the scene, there were a number of hurdles to overcome, but with much persistence, the director got his way. Years later, Malcolm McDowell would meet Gene Kelly, the star of Singing in the Rain, for the very first time at an awards after party. Legend has it that the two did not speak. So there you have it, those are 20 things you didn't know about A Clockwork Orange. You can blink now if you haven't already. Let me know what you made of it all in the comments below, and of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. In the meantime, though, thank you so much for watching. I have, of course, been Adam Cleary, and I will see you soon. Goodbye.